two pastors lived next door to each other. The one man pastored the Baptist church in town, while the other man pastored the Methodist church. Both families had four-year-old children. One tot was a little boy, and the other tot was a little girl. Every Sunday morning, they would wave to each other as they drove off to their respective churches. But then every Sunday afternoon, they would play together in the front yard. One blistering hot Sunday afternoon, the kids were playing in the sprinkler. Well, they got drenched. And so they took off their wet clothes, and they laid them up on the hood of the car to dry. Now remember, they were both innocent children, just four years old. But when the little boy saw the little girl without any clothes, he just sort of stood there, wide-eyed, scratching his head. He was surprised. Later, he told his dad, Wow, I didn't know there was so much difference between Baptists and Methodists. (laughs) Well, obviously, little boys and little girls are alike in many ways. And they should be. They're both human. But there are also some definite differences between them. And likewise, each Christian church is simultaneously alike and distinct. We're alike in that we worship the same God and serve the same Savior and are led by the same Spirit. We read from the same Bible and we've been shown the same grace. We come to the same table to take communion and participate in the same baptism. We will all live forever in the same heaven. There is much that a Calvary has in common with other churches. But there are also some differences that set us apart and that give us our own identity. And in many ways, this variety of churches is healthy and positive. You know, humans come in a multitude of stripes and types. And it takes a wide array of churches and diverse approaches to reach different groups for Jesus. That's why God gives to each church and family of churches its own particular flavor and focus, its own set of distinctives. This is what I want to talk about today, the traits that set Calvary apart from other churches. This week, we'll host pastors and church leaders from about 75 different Calvary chapels. I want to make sure that we know who we are and what we value. Well, our text this morning is Ephesians 2, verse 10. Paul writes to the church at Ephesus, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The word translated workmanship is the Greek word poema, from which we get our word poem. As individual believers, we're God's work of rhyme and rhythm, His work of art. We're His unique and special creation. Like a poet who organizes his words in a meaningful manner, God is shaping us into a sonnet of salvation, an ode to His amazing grace. And I believe that Calvary Chapel is also a poema or a work of God. A special and unique work of God for these last days. God birthed it first through my pastor, Pastor Chuck. And then he's birthed it over and over in other Calvary pastors all around the world. Today I want to lay out 12 distinctives of a Calvary chapel. Our approach to God's grace. To people. To children. To worship. To the scriptures to church doctrine, to the Holy Spirit, to membership, to ministry, to money, to church government, and to the rapture. If we were like every other church in town, why take up space? We'd be better off closing our doors and throwing in with someone else. But there are some differences, some real differences. We're a special expression of God's heart. And I want us to know who and what we are. Well, first, I want us to recognize Calvary's approach to the grace of God. John 1, verse 17. The law was given through Moses, 
But grace and truth came through Jesus. Grace. It's the unmerited and undeserved favor of God. I love the explanation. Grace is love that's on the house. God's grace was paid for by the sacrifice of Jesus. And it comes to us freely. God has saved us and he blesses us. Not because of good works we do or religious deeds. But for no other reason than his amazing grace. You know when I come to Jesus, he takes me just as I am and right where I'm at. He plants his spirit in my life and he begins to work in me from the inside out. It's not up to me to do this or to do that. It's up to me to cooperate with the Holy Spirit's work. What he wants to do in me. Grace and works are mutually exclusive ways of approaching God. You can't trust in grace to obtain God's favor and then rely on your own works to maintain God's favor. No, it's one or the other. Galatians 3 verse 3 says it best. If we begin in the Spirit, why are we trying to be made perfect? Through our own elbow grease. You know, the churches that I grew up in hammered us weekly about what we should be doing for God. The do's and the don'ts. The theme was try, try, try. But when I started reading the Bible... I noticed a different emphasis. The Bible is not about what we should be doing for God primarily. It's about what God has already done for us. God's theme is trust, trust, trust. We grow spiritually not by attempting righteousness through our own efforts, but by realizing we're already as right with God as we can get through Jesus Christ. 1 John 4 verse 19 tells us we love Him because He first loved us. God's grace is what supplies us the incentive to be holy and to witness and to serve and to love our neighbor. The more I realize God loves me, the more I want to love him in return. A Calvary Chapel distinctive is an emphasis on God's grace. Which leads to our approach to people. For a church needs to be a grace place. You see, if God loves each of us just as we are and right where we're at, then that's how we should love each other. 1 Samuel 16 verse 7 tells us, The Lord does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. God doesn't look at the color of our skin, or the cut of our hair, or the clothes that we wear. God looks behind the veneer. God sees the heart. And this is how we should see each other. God's love transcends racial and cultural and economic barriers. It's grace for every race. God's grace picks people up despite their background or problems. It elevates them as children of God. It forgives and fixes them. Then it unites them in a common future. Heaven will be a hodgepodge of people. And the church should reflect the same demographics here and now. One of the distinctives of a Calvary is a warmth and an acceptance of all people. Hopefully anybody from any walk of life or situation or political persuasion can walk through our doors and sense God's love for them. The first Calvary in Costa Mesa, which began in the mid-60s, it reached out to the countercultural hippies that had flocked to Southern California. And Calvary has been reaching out to the disenfranchised ever since. Here's what happens in a grace place. Folks who aren't accepted anywhere else become accepted. People who aren't loved get loved. Hey, remember on the night before his crucifixion, Jesus said of his followers that the world would know that we're his disciples. How? By our love for one another. 1 Corinthians 13 teaches us the greatest of God's gifts is love. And while we're talking about people, Let's talk about Calvary Chapel's approach to the little people, to the children. You know, once the disciples, they made the mistake of thinking that the master was too busy for the kids. And when they turned the children away, Jesus responded, Allow the little children to come to me. In our children's ministry, from nursery to way street to middle school, we try to create an environment where learning is fun. Kids need to be taught on their own level. We want our children to look forward to coming to church. 
This is why we run our children's ministry simultaneous with our adult worship and Bible study. It spares the kids the boredom of an adult service and it provides them a worship experience to which they can relate. One Sunday, Kathy was out of town and I had the three older kids for the weekend. Well, Nick was just a kindergartner, but he was mature for his age. I thought he could sit next to me during the worship and then the, and then the Bible study, but man, was I wrong. Just as I started to teach, his paper airplane launched. (laughs) And before I knew it, he was in the floor, crawling all over the altar, buzzing the altar with that paper airplane in his own little world. Well, I tried to ignore him at first, but man, it's impossible. And so I interrupted my own message, walked over to him and told him I'd see him in the foyer when I was done. But that did it for me. Hey, God made preschoolers to learn by exploration. You are fighting against God to expect a child to sit through an adult-oriented service. That's why we don't encourage children under six to be in our sanctuary. Yes, I can distract others, but that's not really the point. Most importantly, it's unfair to the kids. You know, when I was a child, our church had the traditional format. The kids and the parents, they both sat in the sanctuary side by side. And here's what happened. The parents had to devise little ways to hold their child's attention. And so my dad would play tic-tac-toe with us and pass out lifesavers. And then we'd count the ceiling tiles. And then we'd count the people in the choir. Not only were the parents not paying attention... But without realizing it, we were being taught how to come to church and not listen. That's not what you want to teach your kids. So by the time the kids got to the age where they could finally glean something from the pastor's sermon, guess what? They were conditioned to ignore what was being said. That's tragic. We want our kids to grow up excited about church. And speaking of our Sunday services, let's talk a bit about our approach to worship. You know, the Bible tells us that the whole purpose of our existence is to worship God. Humans not only please the heart of God, but they find their greatest fulfillment in praising and in worshiping God. That's why at Calvary, a choir only comes out on special occasions. You know, when a choir sits in front of the congregation each week, it creates an impression Eventually, you start to assume that the choir is supposed to be singing to the congregation and the congregation is supposed to be singing to the choir. Performance and entertainment begin to overshadow worship. See, at Calvary Chapel, we view you. The congregation is the choir and God is the audience. We have worship leaders, but their job is just to direct us to God. We want to sing our songs to God, not each other. We want to communicate our praise personally and directly to God. We're not just singing, we're expressing our heart. And that expression always needs to be voluntary and natural. It needs to rise up out of an attitude of awe and wonder and gratitude and love. You know, if the worship leader has to get up here and pump us up or hype us up into worship, there's something wrong. It's a flawed sacrifice. It needs to flow from our hearts to the throne of God. Well, notice too, Calvary Chapel's approach to the scriptures. Ann Landers once published a list of real answers that people gave to a Bible knowledge survey. Here's the top ten erroneous answers. One man thought Noah's wife was Joan of Arc. Number two, Lot's wife was a pillar of salt by day and a ball of fire by night. (laughs) Number three, Moses went up on Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments. The seventh commandment is thou shalt not admit adultery. (laughs) Oh no, slip of the tongue. Here's another one, Joshua led the Hebrews in the battle of Jericho. Well, that can be a battle, but that's not the issue there. Solomon had 700 wives and 300 porcupines. 
the people who followed Jesus were called the 12 decibels. <laughs> Jesus was born because Mary had an immaculate contraption. <laughs> the epistles were the wives of the apostles. And number 10, a Christian should have only one wife. This is called holy monotony. <laughs> well, apparently the world today suffers from an acute biblical illiteracy. Even Christians are ignorant of the book they supposedly cherish. It's sad, but the average believer knows a few Bible stories and a couple of random verses, but they lack a comprehensive knowledge of the Bible. As a pastor, I need to teach the book, the whole book, and nothing but the book. A.W. Tozer put it, nothing less than a whole Bible can make a whole Christian. You see, a Calvary distinctive is the systematic study of the Bible. I, I once received a letter from a member of our church. It was one of those encouraging notes that a pastor keeps and he pulls out on difficult days. At one point in the letter it read, Thank you for teaching God's word and not a lot of other stuff. Now, I really appreciated the compliment, but quite frankly, I don't know what a pastor talks about if he doesn't teach God's word. A Calvary distinctive is to teach the Bible verse by verse, chapter by chapter, cover to cover. In our 30 years as a church, we've been through the New Testament four times, and we've been through the Old Testament three full times. And this week, in our TBG groups, we're working through two more chapters. I hope you'll join one. Which brings up Calvary's approach to church doctrine. Hey, just because we're non-denominational doesn't mean we don't know what we believe. Though we're contemporary in our methods, we are traditional in our beliefs. We affirm all the historic doctrines of Christianity. We believe in the Bible's inerrancy. In God's triune nature, that God created all things in the deity of Jesus, in his atoning death and bodily resurrection, that salvation is by grace through faith, in the power of the Holy Spirit, in the rapture of the church, and in the second coming of Jesus. On these crucial doctrines, we remain dogmatic and unbending. And yet there are other areas of Christian doctrine where we're a bit more flexible. Once during a baptism, I had an older lady ask me if she could be sprinkled. Well, when we baptize people, we usually immerse them into the water. We believe that's the New Testament method. But she was uneasy about going under the water. She said she thought she'd have a heart attack if I put her under that water. And so I started thinking, I don't think it's God's will to have a woman have a heart attack while baptizing her. <laughs> and so what did I do? I sprinkled her. I mean, what mattered was her desire to identify with Jesus. And yet, did you know churches have split and denominations have formed over that very issue? I, I like the old adage, in the essentials, unity. In the non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. Remember, none of us has perfect theology. As Paul said, we see as in a mirror dimly. We're all growing in our knowledge of God and His Word. That's why we should show each other some tolerance. A little humility goes a long way. We're all works in progress. In the non-essentials, we need to learn to disagree agreeably and not break fellowship over trivial matters. At Calvary, we believe that Jesus is the main thing. And our goal is always to keep the main thing the main thing. And while we're talking about doctrine, let me explain our approach to the Holy Spirit. For we believe that the Spirit of God is at work in the world today. In the Gospels, Jesus spoke of three experiences we can have with the Holy Spirit. In John 14, Jesus said the Spirit is with us and in us. He's with us before we come to Christ. He's convicting us of sin. He's pointing us to the Savior. He comes to dwell in us at conversion, to cleanse us from sin and transform us into the image of Jesus. But there is a third experience we can have with the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, 
Jesus said that the Holy Spirit would come upon us. This occurred on the day of Pentecost and afterwards. The Spirit filled the disciples, made them bold witnesses for Jesus. It was an outpouring of supernatural empowerment, and it was often accompanied by spiritual gifts. At Calvary, we seek this power of the Holy Spirit. We can't be effective without it. We believe both in the baptism of the Spirit and in His supernatural enablings. We believe they're still available to believers today. And as with all God's gifts, they are received by faith. Yet the question arises, where should these spiritual gifts be exercised? For example, the controversial gift of tongues. Hey, I believe in tongues. It's a beautiful gift given by God as a means of praising Him in an uninhibited way. But here's where our approach is both balanced and biblical. First of all, will everyone speak in tongues? Well, 1 Corinthians 12, verses 29 and 30, lists a series of rhetorical questions. Paul asks, are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Do all speak with tongues? Well, the obvious answer is no. Not everyone has the same gifts. Not everyone will speak in tongues. And second, should tongues be exercised in the Sunday morning assembly of the church, the public assembly? This time, 1 Corinthians 14 tells us no. It tells us that the gift of tongues is reserved for a person's private devotions or for a small group of knowledgeable believers. There's a proper place and time. You see, Calvary believes in the gifts of the Spirit, but we also recognize the biblical guidelines for the use of these gifts. Hey, we want the fire of experience. But when it rages out of control, it burns down the house. Yet when the fire of experience burns within the fireplace of God's Word, the whole house is warmed. Tragically, in some churches, really weird stuff occurs in the name of the Spirit that I think the Holy Spirit has nothing to do with. In John 14, verse 26, Jesus said of the Spirit, When the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. Now notice two points here. First, the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of truth. He is the author of God's Word. That's why the Spirit will never do or say anything that contradicts God's Word. He's not going to contradict himself. And then second, the Spirit comes not to promote Himself, but to testify of Jesus. This is why I worry about churches that are preoccupied with the Holy Spirit. My hunch is is that the Spirit isn't doing the leading. If He was, the emphasis would be on Jesus. A church that's truly full of the Holy Spirit will magnify and glorify Jesus. Well, another Calvary distinctive is our approach to church membership. In one sense, if you're a member of the body of Christ, you're a member of our church. We have a church of billions. We want to embrace anyone who comes to us with a desire to fellowship in Jesus' name. Besides, if God accepts you into his family, who are we not to accept you into ours? At Calvary, we acknowledge that there's only one true church made up of members in many churches. But as to formal membership, As to a role, we don't have one. I grew up in a church that had a thousand people on roll, but only 300 people showed up. But you know what? We ran around town bragging about how we were a church of a thousand people. Hey, here at Calvary, we just let God take care of the paperwork. People ask me all the time, how many people come? And I tell them, I don't know. And I don't. What matters is that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. That's what really matters. Understand, Calvary Chapel is a fellowship. On a national level, we're just a fellowship of churches. On a local level, we're a fellowship of believers. We're followers of Jesus who have voluntarily agreed to live together in community. You know, the New Testament teaches that the church is more than an organization. It's an organism. It's a living thing. A living body of believers coming together in Jesus' name. That means that in the truest sense of the word, you become a member of this church by being a member. 
by participation. My arm is a member of my body, not because it walked an aisle and signed a card, but because it's connected, because it functions together with the rest of my body. And likewise, you're a member of our church by hanging out with us and growing together with us and serving the Lord with us. And if you stop hanging out, you stop being a member. And speaking of serving together, let me mention our approach to ministry. You know, in a lot of churches, pastors are called ministers and the people are called the laity. And what happens is the pastors do all the ministry and the people just lay around. Well, at Calvary Chapel, every member is a minister. You know, Ephesians 4 teaches that the pastor's job is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. It's not my job to do it all myself. It's my job to teach God's word to you so that you'll be equipped to reach out and to minister in your home and at work and in the community and on the mission field and in the church. 1 Corinthians 12 likens the church to the human body. Every member is part of that body and has a vital function. We believe that you too have a place in this body. and We want to do all that we can to help you discover your role. But here's a vital principle when it comes to service. Involvement in ministry should always be voluntary. Fruitful ministry comes from the heart and is led by the Holy Spirit. When people are pressured or badgered into serving or made to feel guilty, then they'll serve with strings attached. At Calvary, we don't beg or plead for help. We don't tighten the screws. If we've got a Sunday school class where we need two teachers and we don't have two teachers, we only have one, well, we just have one big Sunday school class and we pray for another teacher. We love people, we teach people, and then we love them some more until they're equipped and until they're willing. But we want everybody who serves to do so, not because they feel like they have to, but because they want to. You know, Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 9 verse 7, God loves a cheerful giver. And I have found that a church full of cheerful givers is a really fun place to be. Which brings up, our approach to money. We believe that God's work done God's way will never lack God's support. As my pastor has taught me, where God guides, he provides. It's tragic when a pastor gets up and represents God as broke. Oh, he's on the verge of bankruptcy. He's in need of you to pitch in this morning. That's not true. God has boundless resources at his disposal. He doesn't need us. He gives us the privilege to be involved. Week after week, pastors get up and they tell people to trust God for their finances. But then the church springs a leak and what happens? The pastor tries to patch it by pleading and begging and preaching that sermon on tithing. Pastors also need to learn to trust the Lord. This is what our leadership tries to do. We recognize that you're the ones that drop your tithes and offerings in the box on Sunday. I doubt that the angels make much money or give a big contribution. But I want you to know I'm looking past you to the God who prompts you. I believe the Bible holds up tithing 10% as a good guideline for our giving. But it also teaches us that we're free from law to walk in the Spirit. Thus, I'm not about to legislate when and how much you should give. The amount and the percentage and the destination of your gift is really none of my business. Besides, if I insist on 10%, the Lord might tell you to give 15%. Let's just all give as the Lord leads. And we all should give, for God has given us so much. How can we not give back a portion to Him? The more we give, the more we find he wants to give to us. You know, giving is like serving. It too should be done because people want to, not because they feel like they have to. Again, God loves a cheerful giver. You know, a person once came up and asked me, said, Sandy, I can't believe you guys have never passed the offering plate. You guys must have a really wealthy backer funding your church. 
I said, ah, you figured us out. And his name is Jesus. Well, another Calvary distinctive is our approach to church government. When it comes to church leadership, the overarching principle is that we believe in servant leadership. That the highest ranking person should be the servant of all. The people of the church don't exist to serve the pastors. The pastors are here for the people. The church, though, is not a democracy run by the people, nor a monarchy run by the pastor. It's a theocracy run by God's Spirit. The leaders should be on their knees seeking God for direction. The followers should be on their knees asking the Lord to bless their leaders. And under the headship of Jesus, we believe the biblical structure of church leadership involves three groups. Pastors, elders, and deacons. First, the pastor is responsible to teach and to lead. Did you know that one day, I know this, believe me, I wake up under this thought every day. One day, God is going to hold me responsible for the spiritual nourishment and direction of this church. Thus, I need the freedom to hear from God and to follow his leadership. Throughout the Bible, from Moses to Peter, God chooses men. He anoints a man, not a committee. And he leads through that servant leader. Thus, Calvary believes in strong pastoral leadership. You know, the idea of democracy, that everybody has a vote, it's an American invention. It's not biblical. You see, the pastor isn't a hired hand or an employee of the church. He's a shepherd who loves the flock. If you want a hired hand, fine, but at the first sign of trouble, he'll abandon the sheep. It's just a job to him. It's just a paycheck. Yet a shepherd loves the sheep. He makes sacrifices and takes risks and lays down his life for the sheep. You want your pastor to be a shepherd. And pastors don't lead in a vacuum. They're assisted by elders who help oversee the spiritual needs of God's people. And deacons, men and women who serve in practical ways. We call deacons the designated doers. You know, to me, the church has made an awful mistake down through the centuries in trying to be dogmatic on church structure while compromising the quality of the leaders who fill that structure. Our attitude should be just the opposite. Hey, we can be flexible and practical with our structure, but we should never drop the bar on the spiritual qualifications of the leaders involved. Well, finally, let me touch on the Calvary approach to the rapture, which is we're going. And I'm looking forward to it. We believe that just before judgment comes down, baby, we're going up. The Bible promises the church that those who are in Christ will be saved from the wrath to come. And we believe that Jesus can return for his church at any time. Theologians call this the doctrine of imminency. This is why we believe that the rapture occurs before the final seven years of great tribulation. For any other timeline means that something else needs to happen first. Under other scenarios, you're no longer looking for Christ, but for the Antichrist. Heaven forbid. We believe the Bible wants us to be looking for Jesus. Did you know 2 Timothy 4 verse 8 promises a special crown to everyone who loves the Lord's appearing? That's not a hard crown to get. The pre-trib rapture is more than just an eschatological theory. It's our blessed hope. And it has a purifying effect. Knowing that I can see Jesus at any moment keeps me on the edge of my seat. It keeps me from getting bogged down in the things of this world. The imminent return of Jesus keeps our heart fixed on eternity. Well, there you have it. In conclusion, let me admit that this Calvary, in fact, any Calvary, is not a perfect church. We have our shortcomings and our deficiencies. And I'm certainly not the perfect pastor. I know that may shock some of you. Just ask my wife. 
If you know me, you know how true that really is. Here's what we are, though. We're just believers in Jesus, man. We're hanging on by God's grace. In one sense, it's a slender thread. We're only hanging on by one slender thread called grace. But in another sense, the longer we hang on, the more we realize that that slender thread is stronger than a thousand ropes. We're saved by grace. And it's grace that restores our dignity as children of God. It's grace that shapes us into Jesus' image. The one thing we really want to be is genuine. Our part is real faith. Well, now that you know who we are and what we value, I hope you'll climb on board. Help us be God's poema. Together, let's be God's workmanship.